Welcome to the Green Building Show, where we investigate green design and building trends throughout Australia. Hi, I'm Carlos Martinez. This month on the Green Building Show, we're going to be looking at the carbon neutral home. To kick off the series, I speak with Chris Reedy. He's an associate professor at the Institute of Sustainable Futures. And later in this episode, we also catch up with Light Home Ambassador Misho Fasilovic, who brings us his latest ambassador's choice. And now it's time for What's Hot. Welcome to What's Hot. Today we're talking about upcycling. So Victoria, tell us, what have you got? Upcycling. Well, it's, the, it's a fantastic, fantastic idea. Um, it's, it's similar to recycling, but it basically says take something old, discarded, forgotten, unloved, give it some kind of a, a twist or a tweak and create some kind of treasure from it. Um, in the latest edition of Light Home magazine, actually, we've got a fantastic quote from Grand Design's Kevin MacLeod in which he talks about how he used part of a tractor, um, shot a deer, uh, skinned the deer, uh, learnt how to tan it, learnt how to sew and from this created a beautiful chair. Amazing. It's that kind of idea and obviously everybody's not going to do that at home and there are lots of people out there who do it for you such as um, we cover in this issue uh, a lady called Makey who's Sydney based and um, we cover her beautiful security chair, an old chair teamed with a, an old blanket, boom, art. Uh, we also cover the great guys at uh, Three of a Kind Furniture who might use um, offcuts from dockyards to make beautiful new furniture. Anyway. That's the upcycling, it's fantastic and we cover it in this issue. Welcome to Steal That Idea. Amanda, what have you got for us this week? Well, Carlos, as you know, we get lots of emails from people asking us for ideas for granny flats and backyard studios. So when I was walking through the back lanes of Annandale in Sydney's Inner West the other week, well, I couldn't resist sharing this particular idea. And readers will see, uh, or viewers will see, this picture on the screen, and it's a really fabulous uh, backyard studio that these people have designed. And in fact, it's alongside another backyard studio, which is, you've got to say, chalk and cheese from what these people have done. Now, the backyard studio isn't something that you're going to knock up in an afternoon, I grant you that, and you probably will need the help of a designer and a builder, but the idea that you really can easily steal here is using a really simple palette of materials. Um, and if you look at this particular, um, I guess a little mini home really, in the backyard of these people's houses, um, they do what a lot of the design ambassadors talk about. They've just chosen something really simple. So they've worked with uh, what look like matrix panels that are really geometric and you can see in the picture that they've got all these little shadow lines, which is sort of the gap between one panel and another. And so that really accentuates the geometry of both the material but also the whole uh, backyard studio and then they've done this one other really clever thing they've actually accentuated the lines by putting in a piece of um, anodized aluminium in between the joints and you can see that really clearly here and that just works back ties back beautifully to the aluminium shutters that they've also got on the backyard studio very simply done an idea you could definitely steal welcome to the first of our carbon neutral home series this week we catch up with Chris Reedy all right, well, thank, thanks for being with us, Chris. Pleasure. Um, so tell us, please, what exactly is a, a carbon neutral home and why would a consumer care? Well, a carbon neutral home is essentially a home that's uh, it's a very energy efficient home. So it's been designed to, as much as possible, take advantage of um, the existing natural sunlight, um, both for lighting and for, for heating, um, to use shading to, to cool the house as much as possible. So you don't need to use as much energy to keep it going as a normal home. And then on top of that, there's still gonna be some energy demand from the home. So you put solar panels on the roof to supply that remaining energy. So um, during its operation, the, the home doesn't require any, any extra energy. It generates all its energy itself and it um, has no greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, and, it's, and what are the lifestyle benefits for, for the, the homeowner? Well, these homes um, tend to be very comfortable homes to live in because they've been well designed to take advantage of the, um, the natural light, the, um, the solar access. They're, um, they're very pleasant spaces, um, not sort of the, you know, poorly designed boxes that have to be air conditioned just to be livable. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to use a lot of air conditioning, you, you can get by on the, um, the natural um, solar access. 
big, uh, big advantages in terms of the uh, cost savings on your energy bills over time. So we've seen energy prices skyrocketing. Um, if you can get a really efficient home with um, your own generation on the roof, then you're not having to pay those energy bills over time. So um, that can save you a lot of money in the long run, um, although it costs a bit more upfront, of course. Mm -hmm. And how much upfront are we talking? Well, it, you know, it's going to vary from home to home, but the, the payback periods we're talking about at the moment are probably about 10 or 11 years to, to cover the extra cost of um, the installation of solar panels and the things you do to improve um, energy efficiency like insulation and, and so on. Um, that's probably a bit long for most householders at the moment, most, most home buyers, because they don't think they're going to be there that long. They um, expect to move or um, to, to pass the house on at some point. So that needs to come down, but um, if people are thinking of investing in a home that they're going to be in for 10 or 15 years, then it's starting to make sense now. And solar panels, um, the prices have come down really remarkably in the last few years, so that cost um, picture is changing really rapidly, and, and within a few years I think it's going to make a lot more sense. Okay. And you said earlier, Chris, that I guess there's a, there's a struggle to get carpentry housing out of the demonstration stage and into a more widespread. Is a widespread carpentry housing in Australia, is that a realistic goal, do you think? It's certainly a realistic goal. Um, if you take the example of the United Kingdom, where they've got a um, policy for all new homes to be zero carbon by 2016, um, that's, that's probably the most progressive policy on bringing in zero carbon or carbon neutral homes. But other places have it as well. The, um, California has a, a goal for 2020, for example. So there's no reason why Australia couldn't go down that path and, and set a target for um, having zero carbon homes within the next decade or so. Um, it really just requires a, a policy commitment from um, the government to go down that path. Mm -hmm. So the two major bottlenecks for, for getting carbon neutral housing out to the greater Australia is affordability and government policy? Um, I'd say there's three actually. So affordability certainly, and, and that's probably the easiest to address with the way that the, the price of solar panels is going down. That's, that's addressing itself if you like. Government policy, we don't have certainty for investors in energy efficient and carbon neutral buildings. We need um, a long term policy pathway to be set out. That's what they did really successfully in the UK was say many years in advance we're going to aim for zero carbon homes by 2016. So if you're an investor you can say alright I know that that policy is coming, I can put some money into improving building technologies and I know that I'm going to make my money back because there's going to be demand there. We don't have the same situation here in Australia at this stage. We've got reviews of the building code that happen every now and then. We never quite know what the outcome is going to be. It's a big battle between the different stakeholders involved. So there's no certainty for investors. Is, is the policy going to keep improving or not? Um, the government's looking at that at the moment through its national buildings framework, which is due out late this year, which will set out a policy pathway through to 2020. And hopefully it will depending on the outcomes of consultation that's happened, um, set some actual targets for okay. where things are going. The third bottleneck though that we haven't talked about is um, skills in the building industry. So builders um, are used to doing things the same way they always have. They learn as apprentices on the job from builders who've been doing it a particular way for many years. Um, so they don't necessarily all have the skills to deliver carbon neutral homes. You need to be able to um, work with new types of lighting like LED lighting for example. You need to make the home really well insulated and you need to make it airtight so that you're not having drafts to take away the, the heat that you've built up inside the house. So those sort of skills need to be developed still and, and they're not widespread in the industry yet. And what kind of incentives, incentives are there for builders to, to develop this skill set? Not enough at this stage. There's, because we don't have that policy certainty, there's, there's not a lot of incentive for builders to do things um, beyond the, the minimum standards that are required in the building code. Okay. And in terms of accreditation, is there some sound systems in place to ensure a home is carbon neutral or does, is there a, an opportunity for people to, to greenwash? Well, yeah, there's opportunity there. There's always opportunity for um, carbon cowboys, if you like, to, to get in there with um, 
uh, claims that don't stand up to scrutiny and, and the ACCC has had a big sort of focus on those, those sort of claims in recent years. What can the consumer do to ensure their home is carbon insured? Um, well, at the moment it really comes down to engaging with their architect and their builder to look at the design, um, to make sure that the, they have a big enough solar panel system to cover what the energy use is going to be in the long term. Um, but in terms of a, a really good rating tool that can accredit what they're doing, we don't really have it yet. It needs to be developed and uh, there's hopefully there'll be some movement on that in the, the government's policy framework that comes out later this year. Okay. And what, what, part of the, uh, what part is the carbon tax playing in all of this? Well, the carbon tax, uh, of course, is going to increase electricity bills. Um, not by much compared to the um, other drivers for increases in energy prices. So the biggest ones are um, people using lots of air conditioning on hot days and needing to build the network big enough to deal with that. Um, but carbon price will add a little bit of extra cost on top of that and that's probably going to keep on going up over time. So it's going to keep driving energy prices higher. That means there's, there's more reason to improve your energy efficiency and to um, buy into solar panels so you don't get exposed to those um, price increases over so time. The, 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 the carbon tax is going to drive consumers towards carbon neutral homes? A little bit. It's, the change is at this stage with only a 5% target for reducing emissions by 2020, it's not going to drive a lot of change. The, the increase in prices is quite small and households are well compensated so I, I don't think it's going to be a dramatic shift in the market. Fantastic. Chris Aridi, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I'm here today talking with design ambassador Misho Fasilovich of, of Misho and Associates Architecture and Interior Design Firm and he's talking about the Gilston residence. So tell us Misho, why did you choose it for your design ambassador? Well I chose it for a number of reasons. Um, the, the main reason I'm going to be following through all three of my projects that I'll be looking at for my house is to deal with sites that are difficult, um, being steep and things of that nature, so that we can look at the reasons why a particular project um, such as the one I've chosen is more cost effective for the end user. Okay, great. And so it's obviously built on a very steep site. How, how did the, the architects and, and builders overcome this issue? They've looked at this site um, because of its being quite economical. It was a cheap site to buy because of its nature being quite steep. Um, and then in turn, they've looked at the design uh, of what they could build on the site and the materials that they wanted to use. So the materials that they were wanting to use um, initially when they were looking at were heavyweight materials. Um, but when they started to go into it, they realised that the cost of the heavyweight materials was going to be outside the parameters of the budget. The use of lightweight materials, as I said, was came out of their, was driven by their budget. Originally, they looked at heavyweight materials, and the cost difference was basically double. So, the lightweight materials that they eventually chose, um, they chose for reasons of uh, the cost effectiveness and also material handling on site. So when a truck gets to the site and they have to basically deliver the material, that the transfer of the material across the site is economical rather than having to get cranes in or things of that nature. So please tell me, Michelle, what makes this home sustainable? Uh, a number of levels, Carlos. Uh, the first one I'd like to sort of start on the macro is the Tasmania um, basically generates all its power from hydro so that um, the energy efficiency of the home comes down to basically people using hydroelectricity as opposed to brown or grey or black coal-fired power generated from power stations. Coming down to the house itself, um, we basically have a corrugated external facade and also the roof. Now, the reason this is sustainable is because um, metal has less embodied energy to create it and it's also totally recyclable. And do you think it would have, um, the, the designer and builder would have achieved a similar or the same effect using heavyweight materials rather than lightweight? Well the answer is frankly no because they wouldn't have been able to build half the house because they wouldn't have been able to build their dream house or their aspirational house and the volume that they wanted to create to retiring. So 
the answer's flatly no, they couldn't, they could not have achieved the same volume, the same type of house by using heavyweight materials. This one basically captures the basic dream of everybody to actually design, build, and own their own home. Welcome to You Asked Us, where we address the questions from Light Home readers. This week, we've got a question from John, who's asking, what would be the perfect uh, cladding material to use for the backside of his timber fence? Well, John, to help me answer this question, I spoke with Anthony Melostic. He's the technical manager at James Hardy. And basically he says, using a product like James Hardy's Easy Lap Panel is a really effective um, combination for a uh, timber fence simply because the interlocking chip lock joints make it really easy to put the sheets together. Add to this a little bit of textured paint and you've got a robust and strong looking wall which is very similar to the masonry look. Just don't forget to paint both sides of the panel John because this will ensure the longevity of your, of your new wall. Light Homes Amanda Faulkner is here to help us answer one of our readers questions. Amanda, Martin has asked is there a way to quantify the likely cost of a lightweight home compared to, say, a double brick veneer home? Well, Carlos, as we've talked about, uh, the answer to that is really how long is a piece of string? And it's really hard to give an average cost for building, uh, say, a light home versus a double brick home because there are lots of things which might make your project different from mine, um, you know, size, the kind of lot that you've got, or the soil, the slope, a whole series of things. Well, something that might be useful, we've written it a number of times about the Smarter Small Home and, and anybody who comes to the Light Home website can just um, search for Smarter Small Home and they'll see a number of the articles that we've written about that affordable house prototype. However, one of the other things that happened around the time of building the Smarter Small Home was that they actually costed, um, or they worked out the cost to actually build that home as it was designed and the cost to build that home in brick veneer. And the cost to build that home, which is is a light home was about $140,000 and then the cost to build an equivalent home in brick veneer was about $166,000. So $140,000 is about 85% of what it would cost to build the brick veneer version and some of the things that uh, happened when they had to think about the house built in brick veneer was not just swapping out the wall cladding materials, you know, the brick veneer for the lightweight cladding, but also some of the other things like changes to the structure that would be needed and the roof trusses and the type of roof and the type of slab. So they were all things that drove that extra cost of 166000 there's one other thing that people might find useful and that's a little book called the Smarter Construction Book and inside the beginning of the Smarter Construction Book is a comparison of what it costs to build in one building material versus another building material. And this was done by um, a group of quantity surveyors and builders from around the country. And what they worked out is that the average cost on the eastern seaboard of building with um, brick, uh, double brick was around about, I have these figures here, was around about $222 a square metre for single storey and about $252 for double storey. That's taking into account everything that's to do with building the wall. Now in comparison, the most expensive lightweight cladding material would have cost cost about $140 for a single storey and about $150 per square metre for a, for a double storey. So you can see that's a pretty big gap and if people wanted to know more and in fact if Martin wanted to know more then he could go and have a quick read of the Smarter Construction book which goes into a lot more detail about the, the costs of building um, various lightweight homes compared to brick homes.